As business owners, entrepreneurs, family men, it's difficult for us to find the time to put together projects like these. Even though it's something we really want to do, unfortunately, taking care of the things we have to take care of comes first. However, because of viewer support for people like you, we're able to continue doing this. Please consider joining our Patreon and supporting the Burn and Return podcast. You're listening to Burn and Return, a weekly one hour podcast covering news from the agricultural and turf grass industries. Scritch! Did you hear that? That sound is the sound of the DJ scratch. And what does that mean? That means it's time for another episode of Burn and Return. How's everybody doing? My name is Matt. Sometimes I go by the grass factor and, and, uh, we, we're going to have a little show for you today where we talk about, oh, the things that affect our day to day in the green industry. It could be news from ag. It could be news from lawn care. It could be a little geo geopolitical instances. You never know. We might have a reason to cover it here. Uh, that being said, it ain't just me that rides this rodeo. Uh, we have the bull himself. That would be Ryan DeMay. And then we have the, uh, uh, I, I guess I would be the clown. And then the cowboy would be Ray Ito. Uh, <laughs> gentlemen, how in the hell are y'all doing? Well, you know, it's interesting, Matt. I just checked the weather for the, yep. uh, the greater Oklahoma area. And it looks like uh, this week's forecast is for partly sunny skies. And uh, later on in the week, it could be mostly fucking insane. That's your weather report. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Uh, let's check in down there with Ray. Ray, how's traffic looking on the 411? Oh, Lord. <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> it absolutely sucks. I mean, and we're, only moving at about four, we're, we're only moving at about four ounces per hour. It's weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Four ounces per hour. That uh, Actually, four ounces per hour, I'm thinking more like, Four ounces every second, and that would be uh, gasoline consumption. Ew! You know, I just Sc I all I can report is that there are people out there that are fighting hard enough, doing good enough that they can um, sell enough four ounce bottles of MSMA uh, online illegally to afford the rent uh, to pay their parents for their five hundred thousand dollar house that they live in. So, uh, you know. Just for that little bedroom, it's just, you know, just a room rate. You know, it's not much, not many bottles. So, shop local this Christmas, everybody. Keep that. Keep well, that I've got a, I've got an alternate. That sounds really like, North no, Korean to me, Demay. No, <laughs> old boy actually actually needs to sell enough MSMA to be able to afford his bipolar medications. Ah! <laughs> uh, it sounds like he needs to he needs to switch it up. You might want to check. Hey, I think you can get lithium orotate now, uh, pretty easily on the internet. You should, you should probably, you should probably check it out. I hear it's actually working for a lot of people. So, uh, yeah, as one yeah. who has been prescribed lithium before, um, have at it. Good luck. Let me know how it works for you. <laughs> it might actually take the edge off. For Christ's sake, my God, we got some. Jeez. Nutbags. Uh, speaking <laughs> of nutbags, I'm sure we've got some great topics in the show. Um, I know there's a couple things that I, at least I want to stir the pizzot a little bit because, uh, oh, I don't know who gives a shit. Why not? It's winter. <laughs> everybody's, everybody's got cabin fever. Let's, uh, let's see, let's see what kind of bananas we can, we can get churning in the, in the, uh, <laughs> food processor. Uh, let's check out this week's headlines. This is just the news, and I feel like we are covering this with a little bit more frequency. Am I am I smoking crack there, or is this is this happening more often? Um, there's a high degree of probability of both, but um, what we are what I'm talking about here is a massive fertilizer spill that blocked I-5 traffic Wednesday. 
Uh, Portland, Oregon. Boy, can you imagine the people there that are losing their mind right now? Uh, traffic was snarled in both directions on I-5 between Clark Ooh. County Fairgrounds and I-205 Interchange after a crashed dump truck spilled a full load of fertilizer on the highway. A dump truck and trailer carrying a load of fertilizer toppled over, uh, blocking the interstate. The crash has been cleared and is no longer impeding traffic. It looks like it happened in the rain, so uh, good thing fertilizer is soluble, right? Um, I have oh. not seen uh, <laughs> any, any instances as to what exactly spilled. Uh, I've, I've tried to zoom in on this photo to get a little bit more clear image, but, um, it's not, it's not going too well. I can't, I can't make sense of what it is. Uh, but, uh, kudos, kudos, to all those boy, the, uh, the, the water there is going to be awesome. All right. I'm a little bit zoomed in. I'm going to guess two things here. This is either phosphate or, um, wait a second, wait a second. Which which one is it? I feel like there's two things toppled over. Okay, no, 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 no. That's dirt and sand they put down. Okay, so they covered it with mm-hmm. sand, and then and then I guess they're going to scrape it up. Um, yeah, I can't tell what that is. This time of year, if they're moving something, it's probably nitrogen, if I had to guess, uh, because uh, yeah, yeah, it's probably it's probably nitrogen. It's probably a load of urea. You know, twenty two tons right down the hatch. It probably dissolved. Let me tell you, 22 tons is, it, is a is mountain of fertilizer, absolutely. but in a rainfall like that, it would last maybe an hour before it was completely gone. I, if I had to guess, they put out that sand just to make everybody feel like something was being done in the back of their heads. They're thinking, where did it all go? I don't know. I can't find it anymore. <laughs> it is what it is. It'll be all right. Uh, drones cited as future for aerial applications. Can you imagine why? Uh, drones currently provided precision spraying with herbicides, fungicides, and insecticides can operate in congested areas. I don't know why I keep doing that. Um, this is the future owner of aerial ag services says, uh, that would be Ashcroft, Matthew Ashcroft. I discussed UAV technology during the opening session of the Texas Plant Protection Association's 35th annual conference on December 5th. I started last year with the drone manufacturer in China. That unit ended up in a dustbin following uh, an unfortunate encounter with a guy wire sporting a cell tire. He plans to replace that one with a Hylio drone manufactured in Texas. I want to deal with the company that provides service and will communicate with me in English. Boy, that's uh, Oof, mighty direct up there. Uh, <laughs> other drone advantages include, I ain't doing no damn business with no damn foreigners. Just kidding. <laughs> um, in, uh, it's in, it's in, if, la- if the label ain't in Mandarin, I ain't spraying with no Chinese sprayer. I, I mean, look, I've, I've done a lot of business with, with the Chinese, and I've never had a bad experience. I'll say that. 99% of the time, it's always been a good experience. So I don't know. You, I guess your <laughs> mileage may vary, though. It takes probably helps that I'm married to a foreigner, and I can I can understand the nuance in English, uh, English language. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe that's it. Maybe not. I've never had an issue with it, though. Uh, other drone advantages include impervious to adverse soil conditions, no soil compaction. Uh, they're quiet, remain in the field, uh, no complaints about flyovers, less expensive than aircraft, and large ground spray rigs. Improved spray accuracy of practically no overspray or streaks. Um, they also offer field management services such as crop monitoring, soil assessments, evaluating I- irrigation, drainage, crop protection, and survey. Oh, go on. Uh, Ashcroft anticipates improvements and enhance the capabilities. He said range of capacity will expand. He also expects the line of sight restrictions to be removed and referred to military use where drones are controlled from thousands of miles away. Uh, obstacle avoidance will be better too. Um, anyway, that's what they're saying. Enhancements are coming. It's going to make it's going to make a, a big change. Um, I'm I'm not going to lie. I'm actually a big a big fan of this, um, especially as the improvements do start showing up and. Because I'll be honest right now, I don't know too many people I would uh, feel comfortable with behind the the VR goggles of, <laughs> I think I just saw that. Uh, that was that was Amazon Prime, by the way. Um, and you're one to talk to, asshole. Okay, anyway, I digress. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I should at least get a beep or something on that. Um, but I think... <laughs> So much inside baseball right now. Well, what? Yeah. Tons. <laughs> Tons. The private Jeez. jets on fire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's funny as shit. Um, <laughs> okay. All right, drones. Yeah. So I, I, I'm not going to lie. I am a fan of this. But what I was going to say is that there's not too many people I trust behind the VR, the VR headset 
to make accurate applications right now, right? I'm sure there's a bunch of, of you know, goon squad uh, video game guys that you could train up on these things that would just be absolute wizards on it. But could you imagine pulling like your average spray tech off a true green truck and then like me and uh, and and putting me behind a drone and be like, all right, you're going to go spray a neighborhood. Good luck. <laughs> I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to make it. And, 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 you know, me, the, the dinosaur, the guy who actually needs this the most, I don't think so because I, of all people, would be the guy that you don't trust behind a joystick or a pair of VR glasses. No way. Uh-uh. Not me. <laughs> Definitely not Ray. I'll contest that. I don't even know why, but I'm going to agree to that. Now, Demay, on the <laughs> other hand, I could see him being good at it. Are you, are you are you ready for this, Ryan? Sure. Drone I operator. I mean, yeah, I, I can get behind it. I, I don't know. There's a lot uh, to unpack at, at the turf level of, I think we've talked yeah. a little bit about drones on here before, but, um, you know, finding the right application yeah. is one of the biggest, one of the biggest things right now that is uh, a hindrance, at least in managed turf, we'll say is there's not a lot of products at least on the uh, pesticide market that are labeled for drone spraying on turf grass areas or so that's one thing any okay ryan the the specific prohibition is most turf pro products specifically forbid aerial application there's a specific prohibition you may not apply a product aerially i mean that's just uh and you know what i think it is partially due to the mm. issue of release height and application volume. Because I've seen some drone videos like on YouTube, and they're talking about a playing product at, say, 5 to 10 liters per acre. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay? 5 to 10 liters per acre. And, uh, that is commonplace for large field crop type applications where, yeah, you're going to be spraying at two gallons per acre, which is about, you know, that five to 10 liter mark. However, here's the issue. You're spraying that into crops that have bigger leaves, more surface area for that crop to intercept these small droplets uh, put out by a drone sprayer because uh, I also looked like on my beloved AliExpress at these actual spray drones. Matt, XR110-02 nozzles on the drones. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll say I have well, a... Uh... Go ahead, go ahead, Demand. No, I was going to say the only the only other thing. There's uh, some chatter about potential work uh, that might be done here in Ohio, and it's an interesting concept of using these with pre-planned flight flight paths to fertilize, let's just say, golf course fairways or sports fields, things like that, that are in sort of mm -hmm. a confined space, but for fertility, uh, with the mindset that you would do extremely low rates at much uh much more frequent intervals right and be able to mm -hmm. sort of uh ultra spoon feeding whatever you want to call it and also without the added issue of compact you know compaction from you know whatever type of equipment you're going to take across there to do so so um it's an interesting there's concept granule spread. there's even granule yeah. spreaders yeah. for for these drones i mean i saw that uh 25 kilo uh, hopper for a, for a drone and looking at that i'm thinking gee that would be nice but again from the context of making an application to a regularly shaped area that is also relatively confined like a golf fairway i mean i could see i could see doing that where imagine flinging uh, urea out of one of those drones because that's right now that is the normal application 
for the drones is that they use those to fertilize rice fields quite a bit. Mm. They, they dump that, the fertilizer in the hopper and then they fly it over the rice field because the problem with at least wetland rice is that machinery... You can't get equipment or, on it. Yeah, you can't get equipment on it. And, and that is why, for example, the, the mechanized way to apply to a rice paddy is that blower that I use. You stand yeah, in the and, bank and when of the you're rice talking paddy, about 500 acres, <laughs> it's, yep. it's hard with a blower. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that's, it, I mean, that's like what, that, side dressing in rice tough. is like, it's not a thing because of that very reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you got to broadcast apply and you got to broadcast apply with equipment that isn't going to go into the rice paddy. Hence, uh, I've even seen and used this nozzle that they have where they stand on the side of the rice paddy, right? And it sends that granule like 50 feet. Sends it in 50 feet, right? And the pattern from that granule, from that spreader, is like a curtain where lesser amounts are distributed like at, your at the point of your hand. And then more goes out towards, of course, the 50-foot portion of the pattern. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, you're able to get a fairly even application just by walking alongside that bank. But then let me tell you, Matt, that is some brutal work. That is brutal. Because... Uh... Uh... <laughs> so if, if somebody can make a drone application that is just such a labor savings and we got to look also at the whole compaction issue and even mm -hmm. down to speed right mm -hmm. because what are the what are the speed limits on conventional ground driven equipment they can't run very fast, can they? No. No, right? You can't. I mean, you just can't do it. Whereas if you're doing it aerially, mm, yeah, you, you, you can get it uh, down pretty fast. Because like from what I've heard you can or run seen. run 24-7. Yeah, well, from what I've heard or seen of like these drone applications is an acre every like five minutes. Okay, an acre every five minutes. Yeah. Uh. So I know I'm. I'm. I have a uh, a business associate that uh, has has constructed a two thousand pound. I'm sorry, one metric ton carry weight drone. Um. And anyway, it, I know that's one of the things. But of course, you know, military starts getting in the ball when they they hear you can carry that kind of uh weight on board. <laughs> uh. What's on your Christmas tree? Hint. It's not just ornaments. It's uh, it's dingleberries. I'm just kidding. Uh, perhaps no uh, single Christmas <laughs> custom is more ubiquitous than putting up a Christmas tree. Um, <laughs> here we go. It originated in Eastern Europe more than 500 years ago, and uh, it generates uh, two billion in revenue. People harvest 25 to 30 million uh, Christmas trees annually. Um, artificial trees have drawn criticisms from the chemicals used in manufacturing as well as their carbon footprint, but live trees have drawbacks too. One in particular, the ag chemicals and insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides used in tree oh. farming has drawn remarkably little attention. Uh, people who love their traditional green Christmas trees, uh, even those worried about environmental impact, seldom think about how the trees are grown. I've used a fake tree for about 10 years. Prior to that, I bought real trees. Never considered that there might be pesticides on trees. You can count me in on this consensus, said Michelle Zimba. Pesticides never crossed my mind. Among the most common, uh, commonly used chemicals are chlorothalonil, atrazine, glyphosate, and uh, dimethate, uh, all of which have been known to have impacts on human health. Mm. Low levels of pesticides are commonly found in surface drinking water in Oregon. In 2021, research at Portland State University released data showing that forestry-related pesticides were present in Oregon's coastal waters, a sign that they were flowing downstream from the state's rivers. But... It's difficult to quantify any particular industry's contribution to such widespread low-level pollution over long periods of time or to calculate the risks to consumers. Uh, tree farmers say the pesticides help keep the industry in business by ensuring they have a decent crop to get to market. The reason that growers are using herbicides aren't, number one, for seedling survival. 
Uh, and then it goes on to give more details. Uh, all right. So turns out now it's not just the war on Time's Christmas. Up, it's it's also the war on Christmas trees. Uh, I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I, if, if you didn't see this was coming, you have been absolutely blind because, uh, any and every reason that you can think of to interject the word uh, chemical into the news right now is just 100% being exploited uh, to the nth degree. In fact, if we look at this article, inert ingredients and in pesticides may be more toxic to bees than scientists thought. Oh, turns mm-hmm. out it's not just glyphosate that's causing problems. It's the damn, it's the damn surfactants they're including too um here is one of the things that absolutely drives me nuts about this is uh surfactants in and of themselves if you've ever looked at a molecular structure of a of a surfactant um uh let's see you have uh wait 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 uh okay right let me tell you this aside from a health perspective why would Mm -hmm. one not want to drink surfactants uh so soaps you know they have all these little little uh uh, asterisk marks on it you know do not consume your uh laundry detergent uh don't drink your toothpaste uh don't drink your shampoo aside from the the acute uh, diarrhea or vomiting effects it may induce what is a potential issue that you run into by drinking a surfactant and maybe you know, some of the things that can cleave off of it and create, I don't know, toxic, like actual legitimate low LD50 toxic compounds in the human body. Well, a lot of your surfactants are based on what's called glycol ethers. And glycol, the only glycols that I know, for example, that are relatively benign in the human body, although drinking enough of it and it'll still give you the runs would be either <laughs> glycerol or propylene glycol or polyethylene glycol. But then a lot of the other glycols are toxic. And furthermore, most of these surfactants, quote unquote, in sufficient quantities come to find out they are known as non-selective cytotoxins. In other words, Hmm. anything they touch that's alive, these surfactants have the capability of denaturing the proteins in that cell. And and when that protein is denatured, guess what? That cell is dead. And furthermore, Hmm. what I also know about surfactants is that here's a fun fact. The way that emergency responders deal with, say, a swarm of Africanized bees is they send out the fire truck with firefighting foam. And the reason why they use firefighting foam is because there are no pesticides registered to take down a bee swarm. Thank you, EPA. Hmm. Secondly, that foam or that surfactant immediately gets into the breathing passages of these bees and they're done. Mm. Okay. So wow. I'm you know, you know, you know, Matt, I'm just a bit annoyed to say the least that this person is creating alarm when I know damn common sense tells me bees, for example, are sensitive to being covered in soap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that'll hurt them. One, of the, hurt them. <laughs> one of the other things too, is that, you know, when we talk about PFAS, um, you know, you mm-hmm. have uh, carbon, carbon odd, uh, atoms uh, bonded to fluorine and, uh, and then you'll have some sort of functional group on the end. Right. And, uh, mm-hmm. and a lot of times you'll find surfactants in, in these t- same, uh, types of structures. Right. And, uh, and you're mm-hmm. one site away, uh, from, you know, type of reaction of, of, you know, creating some, some pretty vicious <laughs> compounds, 
so my my point is not that you start drinking surfactants that you're gonna start shitting PFOS. Uh, but what where I am going with this is that you know we think of it as a benign substance because we're around and it's an inactive ingredient in the in the products we use. But the reality is that uh, it's amazing that they are just now catching on that oh maybe it wasn't the pesticides themselves maybe it was the surfactants or in can performance enhancers that were actually posing the greatest toxicity risk right and yeah. then it becomes a bit more of a difficult thing to talk about because sodium lauryl sulfate for example is mm. literally mm -hmm. in just about everything that you put on your skin right or however in your mouth However, here's the little uh, caveat to sodium lauryl sulfate. In sufficient quantities or by certain routes of contact, you damned well better believe that sodium lauryl sulfate has that nonspecific, broad-spectrum cytotoxic effect. Mm. Okay? You better, you better damn well believe it. And you know what really like opened my eyes to this? Back in the 1980s. And the reason why I go back that far, Matt, is that was the inception of Roundup. Right? Mm. Mm -hmm. That was when Roundup hit the market. Okay, here was this product that was sold to us as, okay, this is far less toxic versus what everybody was dealing with, like arsenic or paraquat. However, but you look at this supposedly non-toxic product and there are cautions about eye burns, skin irritation, and for fuck's sake, do not ingest it because you will have a bad time. And, it ha and that bad time had nothing to do with the glyphosate itself. It had to do with the surfactant that the glyphosate was formulated there we go. with. Okay, that, that, that was the thing, is that so we now have to differentiate or clarify what's actually bad. Is, is it the actual herbicide? Because here's what I'm going to tell you about toxicity and irritation testing in labs. You know how they do toxicity and irritation testing in labs? They formulate the product with a biologically inert solvent before administering it to the test animals. They are not testing the product as it is sold to the end user. So see they're testing glyphosate. They are testing pure, for example, potassium salt glyphosate or ammonium salt glyphosate. They're not testing it as Roundup Pro Max with all of the performance enhancing surfactants. It's not the same thing. The lab rat is not getting, te you know, being made to drink. Uh, here, rat, have a shot of uh, Roundup Pro Max. Enjoy. <laughs> That's not happening. They're getting dosed with chemically pure glyphosate dissolved in a biologically inert solvent. There's a difference. Yeah, I wonder what has more potential to be mutagenic glyphosate or uh, specific surfactants with uh, different functional groups at the tail there. What are you going to say? I would probably say the, sur the surfactant. <laughs> yeah, sorry, yeah. Tim Ryan. No, I was just going to say that uh, for all that we've heard this weekend, especially um, for those of us on on, on the Discord, um, <laughs> I you know I, I wish that folks could understand that aspect of it, right? That uh, it is not necessarily the compounds, but you know the products and the way that they have to be made, and again, you know what what's to come here in the future you know the issue is right now is that okay hey we take glyphosate away guess what doesn't go away right 
those same compounds that are going into that product to make it work. And, and guess what's coming behind it, right? Are active ingredients that are inherently more dangerous to the applicator, inherently more dangerous to the environment. So again, I wish that there could just be some nuance and some scrutiny at all levels of, you know, what is really the problem here and not just, Oh, quick, no, hey, Demay. Get rid of it. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, Demay, go, because uh, these surfactants are 2,5-B exempt, so therefore they must be safe, right? Right? Yeah. There's a lot of right? stuff that's on the 25. There's, there's a lot of stuff on the 25-B list that's not exactly uh, uh, toxicologically benign. <laughs> benign. Yes. Yeah, it's insane, yeah. and it, it just goes to point out the absolute hypocrisy of all this. It's garbage, and uh, I just, and the way people get so feverish about it is just it's 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 crazy. They literally just, said glyphosate was colonialism. Yeah, I don't know if I agree with that. You know what would be, though, is if I did have to grow my own food, I just need to find out where I get a patty melt tree. Yeah, you, you, I'm looking you actually got to get, you, yeah, you got to get, can, you got to order get, that out of the catalog. I'm, I'm going to be, they send it to my house. I'm going to be, I'm going to be horrible. Uh, I'm going to be horrible and say, yeah. You all need to uh, get me the uh, the biscuit tree. <laughs> <laughs> You're on a gravy train with however, biscuit wheels, Ray. Yeah. However, uh, you know, I I will settle for the old fashioned lady to make all of those biscuits and gravy. Oh boy, <laughs> they make them. They grow those on trees in East Tennessee, Ray. Come on down. I know. I know, I know darn well they do. I mean, that's. Uh... <laughs> I, I bet, I, I bet, I know an old go out gal out in uh, North Carolina needs saving. They'd make you all the biscuits you want, right? Uh, hey, uh, Demay, how about we check out this week's Jono's turf? Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> Jono's turf. Indeed, he does. <laughs> I'm Joe. I'm gonna give you a bunch of accurate turf facts today. Because Joe knows turf. <laughs> uh, Joe do does know turf, and I'm sure this week will be no different than any other week. So, uh, Ray, uh, transcend us to the pinnacle of of the turf grass lords. Well, listen, <laughs> um, I want to preface this by saying I can't help that this individual keeps popping up on here. It is not through um laziness it is not through incompetence it must it's this individual that we're talking about it's certainly not on my part but uh he right. seems to land himself here often because he just says a lot of things that are not right so let's listen uh again to our good friend ron henry uh and, and see what ron has to say about uh mulching leaves maybe some of your options there take it away ron Thompson is in the live stream. He says, greetings, Ron. I know we can continue to add essential G during this season. However, mm, why is it not recommended to mulch the leaves for carbon? Thanks in advance. So you, there's nothing wrong with, with mulching leaves into the lawn if you're doing, if, you're, if it's a small amount. What I'm not a fan of is if you have a lawn that is like completely covered in leaves, you can't even see the grass. Like I'm not a fan of mulching all that um, into, into the lawn. I'm not, I'm not a fan of doing that. So because there's not, because it's a, kind of a subjective as far as like how much is too much. Um, I tend to tell people if it's, if it's light, if you have a light amount of leaves on the lawn and you want to mulch that, that's fine. But if the lawn is fully covered, I wouldn't, I really wouldn't recommend that. I'd, re I'd recommend getting them, getting them off the, um, getting it off the lawn. You know, you have to think about it. Like the, the temperatures this time of year is not that high. The soil temperatures aren't that high. You don't have as much microbial activity this time of year. So if you have like a, if you have a, a ton of trees in your, on your property and you mulch all that debris into the lawn, um, it's not, you don't have like the engine in the soil that breaks down organic matter isn't really working that well this time of year. And, and you can increase the likelihood if you couple, um, a, a big, like a, a mat of, of like mulched up leaves in the lawn with a lot of moisture, you can create conditions that can, that can lead to diseases. So for that reason, that's why I recommend for most people, do just don't, if you carbon? can just get the leaves off like that, that is not, that's a guarantee, which are really not hurt anything. If you 
have a small amount of leaves and you want to mulch that in, that's fine. And if you want like a middle ground dermaculus, what you could do is this, like whenever the, the, the trees on your property do like most of their shedding, right? So the most of the leaves come down, like that first time when there's tons of leaves, like you can barely see the grass because it's all just leaves all over it, like get that off. And then what falls after that, if you want to mulch that in, like I would, I'd have a lot less heartburn about that, but, um, but I, I, I just don't want people to take, um, here's the thing, I know that mulching is easier because then just getting rid of the leaves. But what I don't want is someone that has like, again, like a, a carpet of leaves in their lawn just to run a mower over it. Uh, and because again, it could be okay, but you can also create conditions where you're you're more prone to have disease problems versus getting getting them off the um, off the property. So. Hey, Ray, uh, Ryan, real quick, if I recall correctly, a furrow slice of soil is 2 million pounds. Is that, is that correct? Correct. Six inches deep across okay. the neighborhood. Correct. Yep. Yeah, just checking. Right, pounds, we'll, we'll, okay. I'll let you move on here. So that's my okay. That that's his answer. So his answer is mulch a little bit of leaves, but not a lot, or don't mulch any at all, or apply the product that he sells in lieu of doing that. Okay. Now, that being said, uh, you've heard for the better part of about 35 to 40 years now at least from uh land grant institutions turf grass researchers that it is not only okay to mulch your leaves but it actually can be beneficial so before we launch into this here gentlemen i'm just going to ask you to you know call it in the air don't need to say it out loud who do you think is going to be right okay got it all right so, Jay Pink, let's first start with uh, the PDF that I sent you over there from the fine folks up at Michigan State there in East Lansing. So, this is a paper from the year 2000, guys, almost 24 years ago, okay? And they have been looking at this particular uh, issue of mulching leaves into managed turf grass, both low input and high input, now since the year 1990, okay? So, uh Basically, what they've we, done is if we is did the paid, math on that, is that is that is that ten years? Did I do that right? Am I doing yeah, that right? Yeah, ten years. Ten years. Mm, wow. Okay. Ten years worth mm. of and they actually multiple, they continued it's not a, after it's not this. A single year greenhouse. Oh wow. No, they continued after this, and we'll look at some data from uh, those early two thousand studies as well. Okay. So basically, what they did here is they they uh, in the three different studies that they looked at, they were taking various rates of leaves, dry leaves importing them and applying them onto a turf area and then mulching them in. And they had different heights of cut that they were using, uh, inch and a half and I believe three inches were the two standards that they set across there. And I want you to look here first at table one. It's pretty interesting to look at the percent of organic matter, percent of carbon in the turf tissue, the percent of nitrogen in the turf tissue, and also the carbon to nitrogen ratio, right? So carbon to nitrogen ratio is not changed, right, within the soil. And we're right there in that sweet spot you know, somewhere 10 to 16, something like that, it'd be an ideal ratio uh, for us to find in a turf grass system, okay? Now, if we look at organic matter, for those folks that are following along on audio, or percent organic matter is actually statistically different. Uh, they actually spread this up by genus of leaves, right? So oak leaves versus uh, maple leaves. Canada, Matt, you know? And <laughs> what's interesting here is that if we, if we look at work. this here, the percent of carbon in the turf tissue, uh, not statistically different, uh, but also too that we've got uh, nitrogen though, percentage of nitrogen leaf is actually statistically different with the leaves having more, the leaves that have been mulched in having more nitrogen in the turf plant uh, the following year. So let's slide down here and look a little bit more here. Okay. Keep going towards the data tables here. And uh, here we go. So this is another one here, percentage of visible leaf litter. So Ron's contention is that you're going to make a layer of leaf litter in the soil, and that is going to, in the short term, contribute to uh, disease development, potentially some other things that uh, might be maladies, right, for uh, turf grass. And in this case here, we're looking at uh, March 31st, the year after they've mulched the leaves in, right? So this is, the, you know, middle, early of, the, early of the following spring, okay? So the inch and a half mower decks, right? We look down through this data. It's only until we get to, um, you know, about fi uh, the 450 pounds, so 450 pounds of leaves per thousand square feet. Gentlemen, that is 
a lot of leaves. That's a lot of leaves. That's why I was talking about a first slice of soil. That is a ton of leaves. What's the bulk density on leaves tapped? (laughs) Probably like two pounds. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it it, it can't be much. It couldn't be. Yeah, two pounds per cubic uh, yard or cubic foot. Rather, it can't be much. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as you look across this here at 150 uh, pounds of leaves per thousand square foot, which I believe would probably be an average and just kind of thinking and doing some quick back of the napkin math and average we're seeing uh five and three percent you know so as we have a higher deck height that percentage goes down uh significantly all right so interesting here another little factoid surface hardness they measured surface hardness with a clegg hammer and actually we're seeing um somewhat uh, softer quote unquote softer conditions out there versus the untreated control okay so slide down here just a little bit more, J Pink. Keep going. And right here. So when they look at uh get your slide up there, carbon nitrogen ratio in the thatch layer of soil, measuring at three inches below the plants. Okay. And what we find here is that the uh the numbers here for percentage of carbon and percentage of nitrogen between the highest amount of leaves. And the control is only where we really see some big differences, okay? So going through this is that mulching leaves is okay. This is what they're proving out and bearing out in this data, that there are no issues. And in fact, there are some benefits, right, from a um, carbon-nitrogen ratio perspective and also from a percentage of nitrogen that ends up in the plant. What's really interesting is that uh, in the following year, so go ahead and go back to that uh picture that screen grab i gave you j pink two things are interesting as they continued this work gentlemen and thing number one is that this uh green up ratings right so these are leaves uh same type of setup where there was three inch and inch and a half height and what we're looking at here is a table of mean green up ratings okay so you'll notice that the untreated checks right are um you know lower here across and really in the april go- april time frame we are seeing statistical differences between them. Okay. So early spring green up as we go into May and we go into uh, late May, early June, there is no difference, right? So it's really that early spring green up. We do see uh, a greater degree of uh, green up. The other thing too, that was interesting with this 2004, 2005 data, they were looking at this as from a weed suppression standpoint, right? So uh, dandelion and crabgrass in particular, and the plots that were mulched saw significantly lower uh, dandelion populations. And even more specifically, uh, maple leaves had a higher uh, incidence of uh, stopping or, 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 or uh, slowing down the uh, germination or eliminating the germination of uh, dandelion. So there you have it, gentlemen. Weed suppression. No, no, you know, Time's disease. Up, I think, over. I think you'd have to, you know, no data here to support this at this rate, but I think you'd have to leave a massive shit ton of layered up leaves, not chopped up leaves, but like layered up leaves to the point where you'd have major issues. And the other thing I'd offer too, Ray, if you want to explain this real quick, but if I was in a situation on a low maintenance turf, let's say that hasn't really got a ton of nitrogen, do you think there'd be any benefit either? A little bit later in the year or maybe even uh, early the following spring of a uh, a small dose of nitrogen in those situations where maybe there's a little bit more carbon out there than we'd like to see would there be any benefit there probably you probably would want to just offset the increased input of carbon but then you know what brian this uh, study highlighted to me look at that early season turf quality, Brian, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. look at how well the turf is performing when mulching was done versus when all the leaves were taken off. I mean, you know, 6.6 versus 8. To me, that is the difference between somebody saying, thank you, my my lawn is nice and green versus them asking, Lawn boy, when the fudge are you going to come out and fertilize my lawn? It's not green. Get out, get your ass out here. 
That is one hundred percent buying you time on your first application. Yeah, and yep. not only that, the, you know how we are always talking about trying to optimize, maximize every single input. To me, it is a no-brainer with multiple benefits to, hey, let's just mulch in the leaves because it, it's free nutrients. Because, guys, I always say this to my prospective clientele. I tell them, a clean yard can be a dead yard. <laughs> That's what I tell them. Uh, because, you see, the norm is every single last leaf, grass clipping, you know, natural plant debris has to be immediately removed from the property at all times. And I tell them, okay, you want to go there and do that? You know what? You're going to have that very clean yard, but you're going to have a dead yard. Enjoy. Enjoy. And, you know, this study just puts an objective number on that because the lawns that had the leaves mulched back in are performing mm-hmm. better. And you know what else they're, they're, perf- they're performing better on? Weeds. Mm-hmm. Weeds, I mean, you because you know how we're always like pushed about how you guys are constantly spraying and spreading fertilizer and you guys don't care. I mean, you guys are just killing the environment. Uh, wait, there's a third way. And that third way is to lower input by having some sense and reason and reusing and utilizing what you have right there in this case it would be the tree leaves i mean this let me ask you uh, oh go ahead (laughs) yeah and this is just an example of managing a turf site smarter rather than what old ron henry is telling people to do is okay clean everything up and because you cleaned everything up and you took away nutrients from that site, now you got to go buy my shit. Matt, let me ask make you it, real quick. Make it, before... make it make sense. <laughs> in what world would you have to live in to suggest to somebody that they need to maybe mulch only a small portion or fraction of the leaves that are on their lawn, but then get those off there so that not only would they not get plant disease, one but two they should then apply uh carbon pro whatever whatever or more, or, or more organic matter a hundred percent and and the, at the very end ron says something this is the last point i want to get some reflection from you guys on uh, he says that applying essential g and mulching leaves are completely different not even on the same planet do you agree or disagree with that statement I couldn't disagree any more than that statement. Um, look, here at the end of the day, here's a, a leaf. If you if you look at that analysis of the leaf on the study, you know, and you were it was I think it was given organic matter contents. Uh, well, they are not very high because um, a leaf is primarily not made up of organic; it's made up of fiber. Right. There's going to be there's going to be a lot of fiber that that occurs there. And the 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 that is. You need a substantial amount of leaves uh, to make up for that for that difference. Right. So. And again, OK, to put into bulk density is what everybody should be concerned with. Right. And uh, when I talk about bulk density, it's right. It's it's. It's the density, which is mass over volume of a given whatever it is you're applying, right? Uh, mm-hmm. If leaves were, were so bad and matting at uh, 450 pounds per thousand square feet, I want you to, to try to wrap your mind around what, what that volume of leaves is. Um, think about uh, when you pick up a trash bag. Full of full of dry leaves, and I'm going to talk about dry leaves because when they're wet, it's just saturated with water, right? And you're feeling water weight. Right. You know, water is 
eight pounds a gallon, right? So if you pick up a gallon of leaves and uh, and it and it feels like it weighs eight pounds, well, chances are it's at about ninety percent saturation point of water. Okay, in this particular instance, you pick up dry leaves, a a, a cubic yard trash bag is gonna feel like absolutely nothing. You grab four of them at a time. And it just takes you 50 <laughs> trips because you don't have enough space in your hands to collect all the bags you want to carry with you. Otherwise, you could carry 30. Maybe you put it all on a tarp and you, you tote the tarp uh, to the front yard and then you can carry all 30 bags at the same time, right? Point being is that it is, it is a very light material. So when you're taking something with the bulk density of soil and you're adding a less dense material to it, the majority of the time, that is going to be a good thing that you're doing, right? You're, 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 uh, you're, you're reducing soil bulk density. Um, and in this particular <laughs> instance, uh, you're providing an immediate green up point, right? It's not to say you can't achieve the same thing with Carbon Pro G, but to pretend like it's different is insane. That is absolutely insane. The only difference there is that you already have a fixed carbon point, which may or may not help facilitate in a faster mineralization of the organic matter portion of it, right? Because you're, uh, you're providing, you know, space and home and uh, adequate environment for uh, microbial proliferation. And uh, so it's not, it's, but, but again, is that something that you and I are going to be able to put eyes on and immediately recognize the difference? No, no one can because it's at the, it's at the uh, the microbial level, right? And we don't have eyes to see things that small and changes that minute. So um, if you had to choose between doing something that is naturally being produced for you for free on your property versus having to go buy something, anyone who tells you going to buy something is wildly different. What they're referring to is the fact that you have to spend money on it. You have to spend fuel on it. You have to take time out of your day. You have to have equipment to do it. That yeah. is... The differentiating I factor, got, not the I gotta applesauce guess, that's in the container. I got to add one more point. You know, talk about removing leaves from a, from a lawn like that. In every instance, Matt, at no time have I ever seen leaves move off of a lawn for free. I've never seen <laughs> it happen, Matt. Okay? because. You know what I tell these people that want that clean but dead yard? I have less than nice words for them. <laughs> I tell them, hey, asshole, how the fuck do you think leaves go off of this property? And where the hell do you think they go? And do you think we have room for that? Uh, think again. And also, then. When your lawn and landscape become so depleted, you then order a ton of compost or you start buying this bullshit in a bag because your soil has become so depleted. Please make it make sense. Yeah, uh, it's it, this is this is Ron Henry in his uh, in his M O in natural his, state. Uh, natural state. Yeah, I mean, this is <laughs> you you would expect nothing more from the guy than exactly what you got out of out of that little snippet right there. Um, okay, moving on. Let's check out this week's burns. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Demay. Legitimately, I learned something right there. This uh, this follow up, this thirteen and fourteen year follow up, and showing the mean greed up ratings. I've never seen that before. That is mind blowing. It counteracts all the bullshit that's been repeated that I've fucking repeated on on YouTube. Uh, that I I hear over the years from other people when there is a overwhelming body of evidence that says to the contrary and you try and logic your way in the shit and that's what ends up happening when you logic your way in the shit we don't know fucking everything right and sometimes you have to cop to that and just be like oh i'll be damned i was wrong this is another one of those examples i was i i would have i would not have said that's how that would have played out and what did the data say it's exactly how it plays out. So you know what, Matt, go fuck yourself too, asshole. 
Um, that, that, we, that is why, for example, I harp right. on that clean but dead yard because I see that all over town played out over and over again. I see it, Matt. That's why when that article or that study was done, the numbers and the, res- and the, obje- and the subjective results, totally unsurprising to me. No surprise to me. None at all. <laughs> I told you so. Um, yeah, the North. <laughs> what were you going to say to me? Sorry, I cut you off. I was going to just say that's why we do this show, because we don't know it all. <laughs> and if we're not put in uncomfortable positions to go and find the right answer instead of just ad libbing and selling our own fucking shit on a goddamn live stream, <laughs> uh, then we would not be pushed to do better, learn more, and uh, provide better information. So. Fuck you, Ron. Uh, speaking speaking of a quest to do better and learn more, the uh, the North Carolina Pesticide Board announces case settlements. Yay! Oh, Yay. You this know is my this favorite is one. This is my favorite one every year. We, we, I think we've done this three years in a row. It is like every year, every <laughs> December. This is like our pre. This is like our early stocking stuffer. Let's see who's done fucked up in North Carolina. Uh-huh. How much they're going to pay. Uh, James oh, S. Gosh. Anderson, uh, a private pesticide applicator for Anderson Farms, agreed to pay $500 for applying restricted use of pesticides after his certification had expired. Uh, David yeah, Dixon a- agreed to pay $600 for applying a restricted use pesticide without a license. Uh, we have Ralph Carr of RC Landscaping agreed to pay $800 for engaging in pesticide applicator business with an expired license. We have Brendan Cordell yes. agreed to pay twenty two hundred dollars mm-hmm. because an illegally disposed of pesticide container leaked onto asphalt at the business, which violates regulations meant to protect human, animal, plant, and environmental health. Yikes! Uh, Robert W. Yo. Creech uh, agreed to pay fifteen hundred dollars because employees under his supervision applied pesticides after his commercial pesticide license had expired. Had expired. Uh, Louis Gonzalez, owner of Tidal uh, Landscapes, uh, agreed to pay $1,200 for applying pesticides after his uh, license expired. Uh, We have William Stratus agreeing to pay $1,200 because employees applied pesticides for the business, although no one with the business had a commercial pesticide license. He had previously been issued a notice of noncompliance for the same violation. Wow, please, what is wrong with people? Um, Kevin Frazier of Raleigh agreed to pay $800 for applying pesticides commercially with an expired license. He then renewed his license. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Timothy Fulcher agreed to pay $1,200 uh, because employees under his supervision illegally disposed of a pesticide container and applied a pesticide to a residential site outside Goldsboro, although the pesticide was not labeled for residential use. There it is. Where have we heard that before? Get caught. Get caught applying non-residential uh, registered products on home loans and uh, write a check for twelve hundred dollars. Hope it was worth it. Let me let me ask: Do you think they saved twelve hundred dollars when they when they grabbed that bottle off the shelf and decided to make that application? I don't know. Maybe Hardly. they have. Maybe it's part of their risk analysis, but uh, maybe maybe and, not. And you know what, Matt? Like, you know what the horrifying it, that was my thing Christmas is? Money, huh? It, this is only for the instance where the North Carolina Pesticide Board could prove that he made that application. Because otherwise, when are the other times that he did something of that nature applying to a non-labeled site? Yeah. How many yeah, times? That I, no, how, I don't want to know. I'm sure it's yeah. absolutely astonishing and you know to be honest no do you know why i bring this up matt Hmm. because many years ago i read in the news about somebody applying a pesticide inside of a home or inside of homes and those homes became essentially super fun fight sites because what they were applying was a pesticide that I know is was only labeled for application to either I think cotton and wheat fields. Hmm. Okay. Huh. And but but anyway, this pest control company, I think it was in, no Florida or uh, or 
or South Carolina or North Carolina. He said, oh, yeah, uh, I, I'm going to kill your cockroaches dead. Because <laughs> what that guy, no, no, guys, what that guy chose we'll kill him gooder. to you. Yeah, we'll kill him gooder because what that guy chose to apply inside of the homes, none other than something I know of by the brand name of Bullidol, Mesoparacyon. Mm. <laughs> and the, the the way it was found out is because the people in those treated homes them and their kids all develop symptoms of poisoning mm. uh, <laughs> yeah because <you> hopefully see... <laughs> what were you going to say yeah, hopefully and the thing is, is that because of what was done, yeah, those homes all had to be destroyed and carted off to a hazardous waste dump. Oh, God. Um, yeah. Boy, <laughs> do you have an insurance policy that covers that? If not, uh, don't, don't do that. Good God almighty. That is on, I guarantee that's on no one's a SWOT analysis on their spray business. Uh, so, uh, you know, an easy thing to do is not make those boneheaded decisions. Cause let's be honest at this point, you know, when you're making those decisions, you, you flat out know, um, beware mm-hmm. says the, uh, the sheriff in Benton, Louisiana, uh, issuing a, a warning to homeowners about a lawn service. It might be overcharging for the work they claim they do. Whitehead Lawn Care made the local news for this. Lord have mercy. They tell homeowners and uh, that they will put pine straw on their flower beds for a set amount per bale. At the end of the job, a representative of the lawn care service will tell the homeowner that they use a lot more pine straw than what is actually required. They would then tell the homeowner that the cost of the service is several thousands of dollars. The homeowners who were contacted by law enforcement stated they felt obliged to pay the large amount of money, even though they knew the service didn't use as much pine straw as the business had claimed. At least one homeowner felt threatened by one of the service's representatives who contacted her about payment in a Facebook post she made about her ordeal. The Bossier's Sheriff's Office strongly suggests that homeowners get in a re- written agreement from any business contract to do services at their home prior to the start of work. If you feel like you might have fallen victim to a crime after using the service, call the sheriff's office. Lord have mercy. God, what a fucking idiot this white hair lawn care guy is. I mean, just peak. What do they say? Never go full R word. This guy went full R word. And uh, you got to wonder about d- the d- business model there. I tell you, the business model is narcissism. Okay, that's that's purely what it is. This is this is a narcissistic uh, uh, asshole, and uh, and and he he deserves his absolute ass beat. I, I made mean, some mistakes. The, yeah, you made some mistakes, and you deserve you deserve an ass whipping. I hope <laughs> they mess with the wrong guy, and uh, and oh, oh boy, is a really really angry vet and just rips this guy's arm off and rams it right up his asshole. That would make me feel good about the whole thing. Um, and then the last one here, how does that even happen? Oh God. A car flies Lord. into and through a landscape trailer in Linfield, according to Boston news, a landscape cruise truck and trailer were parked on Essex street while crews cleaned up a yard across the street. Then suddenly a car came flying up the street. How does that even happen? You know, Initially, she didn't realize what she was looking at. I just saw a trailer in the truck out there, but I didn't see anything else at first. After taking a closer look, I realized the front end of a Jeep sticking out of the front of a trailer. It drove right into and then through the trailer, slamming into the back of the truck that was pulling it. Good. Uh, and yes. I believe, yeah, God. we've got some pictures here of what, of what that looks like. Holy shit. Oh boy, Man. had the doors open on the back of the trailer and, and a ramp down. Just and, drove uh, right up. Yeah. Now listen. Yak ass here. God. My, here's my question on this one is, uh, mm-hmm. you know, basically, uh, Ray turned Sheila into uh, a sexual conquest for rear ending him and, and screwing up his Toro 1000. 
Ray, what mm-hmm. would what would this get you? And and, and this this Sheila's a asshole too. So you you know, she'll take the punishment. Okay, you know, no, you you Maybe know what this discipline. would get me thirsty, Ray. Oh, this would get no no. This would get me. Somebody's gonna owe me a freaking trim <laughs> triplex for this one. I'm not talking walk behind. No no. Somebody's gonna owe it, or, or if not that the. Uh, Somebody's going to owe me a damn multi-pro, okay? That's it. I mean, all bets are off because this is peak negligence right here. This is peak negligence because, all right, I frequently get bugged and hassled because I said, hey, I just, te- I just texted you. Uh, didn't you see my text? It's like, you know what my answer to that is? F off, I'm driving. I don't mess with my phone. When I'm driving, because as I now know, all it takes is for me to be playing with my phone while I'm on the road, and I'm going to end up driving right through somebody's car, and my front bumper is going to be in the back seat of their car. Okay? That can happen. And in the case of this person, the Entire car went from trailer all the way through the trailer, and then it finally stopped when she went head on into the back of the truck pulling the trailer. I mean, you know, the only way somebody can do this is if is if they're driving at fairly high speed and instead of them looking ahead. And paying attention to the road. No, they're looking down, playing with their phone, and not looking. I mean, they're just not looking or paying attention to what's going on because I know my late father frequently told me, you know, when you're on the road, your first job is to drive. Nothing else matters. You know, the <laughs> thing that out of this whole time here is uh or this whole article was that in there the woman that you know heard this she was like oh i heard a big thud but i didn't think anything of it because they cut her off in the quote you only they only took part of the quote from the newspaper because i'd just gotten a mailer uh from a different company that was five dollars cheaper and if the people that i was paying right now died anyway i might not have to pay them and i'll just go with these other guys fuck them they're the lawn boys mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, somebody all i heard was uh hey i no longer have to pay meat crayon lawn care anymore so. uh-huh hey, tin can lawn care is out of business see ya uh let's check out this <laughs> week's returns la, 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 is probably gonna come after me for that you think la, 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 <laughs> Uh, bad news for the activists out there. Man, there's been a lot of bad news for the activists. Uh, it turns out nitrogen does not destroy organic matter, but actually builds <gasps> organic matter in the soil. <gasps> it turns out uh, <gasps> uh, glyphosate does not decrease soil biodiversity. Uh, it increases oh. soil, uh, it helps uh, maintain uh, uh, soil biodiversity and actually improves uh, it, it provides even additional advantages to no-till or uh, uh, limited-till cropping systems. And now, <laughs> it turns out, genetically modified crops are solving food insecurity at a greater rate than what they thought by uh, uh, providing uh, an avenue for 37% less pesticide uses, uh, usages, 22% higher yields, and 68% greater earnings for farmers. Damn it, man. Uh, food insecurity and undernourishment are currently under the most uh, serious anxieties for human health. As the world's population goes on to increase, there is a greater demand for food. The arable land is not is not rising. Therefore, we have to find some sort of solution to feed the population of the world estimated to be 10 billion by 2050, which everybody said it was not possible. We're all going to die and starve to death. Well, it turns out there are some benefits of genetic engineering and agriculture that are increasing crop yields, reducing costs for food and drug production, reducing the need for pesticides, and enhancing nutrient composition and food quality, resistance to pests and disease. Holy shit. (laughs) GM-grown crops uh, commercially in different countries are potato, squash, pumpkin, alfalfa, brinjal, sugar beet, papaya, canola, soybean, maize, rice. 
strawberries, cotton, and tomato. I'll say this in the United States, pretty much all that you're going to see that is genetically modified is, uh, is primarily going to be some alfalfa, soybean, uh, cotton, and, uh, and, um, uh, corn, corn, right? But maize, yep. maize, right? Uh, as you maize, get into yeah. Canada, you're going to see more of the GM canola. Uh, you're, you, you'll probably see some sugar beets up there too. Maybe in North Dakota, you'll see some, uh, some roundup ready sugar beets. Um, but as far as like strawberries and papaya and pumpkin and squash, there's just not a giant, uh, uh, market for it right now. I haven't seen a ton of it out there. In fact, I was looking the other day at, uh, glyphosate usage by crop. Uh, and in the U.S., uh, soybean, corn, and uh, uh, soybean, corn, and cotton make up uh, roughly eighty-five percent of all the glyphosate used in the United States. So, uh, you know, there, there you go to put that in. But the good news is, is that uh, as as we continue to make these these modifications, and, and look, a lot of these modifications are dealing with two things, right? Is it Roundup ready or uh, uh, modifying against, uh, catastrophic diseases. Right. And, uh, mm-hmm. and look, or, or catastrophic, uh, pest infestations and look, look, look what's happening here. This is a good thing. However, I'm sure this is going to be spun up as a bad thing that, you know, we're all going to die. We all have cancer. We're wrecked. Um, it's, it's the end of the world. Um, okay. Um, let's check out this week's returns. This is, I am on the returns. This is a return. What am I doing? Yeah, this, I started yeah, reading the mailbag. I do this live, right? I started reading the mailbag <laughs> as I was as I was finishing that to try and keep it moving. So we're just, we're gonna play the sounder twice. Off the record, the history of turf grass information file, the TGIF, is a remarkable success for the USG Green section. Uh, MSU libraries made the TGIF database uh, publicly accessible to everyone. Uh, in the early 80s, the Green Section Turfgrass Research Program, now the Mavis uh, Program for Advancing Golf Course Management, identified a pressing need, a comprehensive turfgrass re- research reference library accessible through a computerized database. Um, uh, secure the, uh, I, I, I can't talk anymore. Demay, will you, will you, will you, you see uh, yeah, this? I, I'll, uh, yeah, I, I'm I, struggling. I'll pick it up. Let me collect my thoughts. Uh, you go ahead. Please do that. Uh, so turfgrass information file. Again, we talked about this uh, oh a few months ago, but uh, where it came to be from is uh, Michigan State. They were donated a whole bunch of stuff um, from O.J. Noer, who was a turf grass researcher and professor at the University of Wisconsin, and MSU sought to kind of collect all of his stuff and a whole bunch of other stuff from uh, outside sources and, and put it together in one database. So. Again, uh, if you do not or have not been on this site before, it used to be uh, paid access only either through university or through a, a professional trade association allied with turf. Now it's completely open and free. So any subject that you can think of that's had anything published on it, whether it be in a trade magazine, um, some video formats, and there's podcast stuff on there, uh, peer-reviewed articles, anything of the sort, Uh, it's on there. So I highly encourage you to go uh, check that out, poke around in there and look and see what's there. It's a vast resource of information that you're not going to find anywhere else. It's very, very easy to navigate. And again, uh, this is probably the best return of the whole year, that there is such a significant uh, wealth of knowledge and resources and information that's available to all of us now, right, to dive in and see. So I know this is something that I've used um, for the past almost 25 years uh, and being able to dive into it. And so uh, it's a good thing. I'd highly encourage you to check it out. Okay. And uh, mailbag. You've got mail. mailbag. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to read this here and, uh, and Chris, look, I don't know where you drew the conclusion that you came to on this. But it is absolutely bizarre, and I'll explain to you why. But let me read what you wrote to me first. Uh, It says, didn't even get past 40 minutes. I get it as part of the culture of this group. Sometimes it's fun to go off on a tangent on current events, but I subscribe for the turf show, not drawn out tirades on culture. And By the way, Matt and Ray, you guys are flat wrong. As a parent of teens, I can tell you the apathy that you're alarmed by is a product of adults not having empathy for them. These kids got largely fucked by the pandemic. Can you imagine being a high schooler when that all went down? A college freshman? Anyone under 21? Given the state of world affairs right now, you can blame them for not putting on a rosy attitude. Can you blame them for not putting on a rosy attitude today? 
I spend at least five to 10 minutes a day with each of my kids. I have two correcting the misinformation they consume from social media, crappy journalism they consume from mainstream media. It has been a real joy since October 7th. Let me tell you. Lastly, they are kids. You all were too. Get over it. Smile at them anyway. Hope that someone is loving them and mentoring them somewhere. Chris, I don't know what you heard me say, but what I said after encountering that lady was that I wanted to go give her a hug. I talked to her with a smile on my face. I felt nothing but empathy for her. And exactly what my wife said is exactly what Demay said was that it begins at home. And again, I reiterate that in that particular scenario, I wanted to go give that girl a hug. One thing that you may not know about me because you've never met me in real life, you only see this side of me, which is a little chaotic, which is pretty <laughs> close parallel to my real life too. <laughs> But also in my real life, when I'm not in a chaotic state, typically I'm smiling. I'm a very pleasant person to be around. I make sure everyone around me is having a nice time. And I guarantee you there is no one that you're going to meet that is kinder than I am to people who work in service industries, whether it be retail or a home repair guy or a mowing guy. And the reason why is because I worked in the fucking service industry for the majority of my career. Whether now in manufacturing, I still provide a service. When I was a lawn care guy, I provided a service. When I'm designing things, I'm providing a service to someone for what my talents are. I 100% feel nothing but empathy, and I hate it. I absolutely hate it that these kids are stuck in this situation where they cannot express an ounce of happiness or an ounce of anything beyond apathy. That is what freaks me out, is that what we have put them through, exactly like you state right here, the last four years, the chaos that is reading the news, the chaos that is the local news, and no one is there to tell them any different. No one is there to give them a beacon of light at the end of the day. And what you don't know about us is that I'm glad you enjoy the turf segment, but did you know that we have awarded two fucking scholarships to people? But you know why? Because... We want to pass on the same thing that gives us an opportunity to look forward to our day and generate smiles and generate happiness and generate opportunity. We pre we practice what we preach. We raised fifteen thousand fucking dollars for St. Jude this year collectively. You know why? Because it's something that matters to us. Because it generates a smile on my face. In every email I get from St. Jude. That is a story about one of the childs that went through there. I read it every week when I get it on Friday, and I cry every Friday as I read it. Do not come at me about not having empathy. You know not of what you speak, sir. You need to quickly remove the top of your head and put your brain back in with some texture to it instead of removing it and letting it smooth off with whatever sandpaper you're using on it. It's not good for you. Stop doing that. You need to calm down and stop thinking that everyone is attacking your kids. I have two kids myself. I have to do the same thing. And because of their ages as an, a pre-teenager and a little bit younger one, I have to spend a little bit longer than five to 10 minutes with them a day because they can't process all the information. And I have to talk to them like an adult to explain the reality of the world we live in right now and why I would recommend, due to my experience, to look at things this way or a tackle a problem this way. But you're your own human. You make your own choice. And trust me, as you make mistakes, I have empathy because you're looking at a former drug addict, a drunk, anything else that you want to label me a complete failure in business. I've done it fucking all, every fucking bit of it. I've done it. So, Chris, your words, I do not take them well. You can suck my dick and go fuck yourself, asshole. Fuck you. <laughs> it's been a great show. I appreciate everybody for hanging out. I and I and I, I I promise you I would treat your kids a thousand times better than I would me that I just treated you right here because I do respect your fucking kids and I feel incredibly sympathetic for what they had to go through for the last three four years because it fucked me up too it fucked up everyone in my house it fucked up everyone across the world that's why the world's in the constant state of fucking chaos that we're in right now so suck my yeah. dick asshole and you know Jesus. what here's what I'm gonna tell you is I have a lot of empathy for people too. But, okay, there is a difference now between empathy and playing victim. Okay? 
that is something that was instilled in me is you know Matt these times are super foreign to me do you know why these times are so foreign to me hmm. because the way I grew up there are no vic- there's no victimhood there are no excuses you don't get to blame the rest of the world for what's happening to you in other words what's happening to you how you feel etc cetera, etc cetera, is all on you and if something is not right it is due to choices that you have made or you haven't made okay it's all on you and uh therefore uh i i, I look at this and I say, okay, children, I notice these days a lot of them are two things that are rather foreign to me. Two things. One is victimhood. Second thing is entitlement. Because the other thing that I learned growing up is nobody owes you anything. Nobody even owes you empathy. But nice people, out of the goodness of their heart, and good people will give you a lot of empathy. But then, you know what? Remember now, they don't owe you a thing. Hey, chat right now. Chat. Y- y'all have spent time with me. In fact, the majority of the people in the chat right now have spent time with me. How many times <laughs> have you been with me out in public and ever seen me be mean to fucking anyone? Aside from John Perry, but we ended up hugging, and in fact, I humped the guy at the end of it. <laughs> walked him home, as a matter of fact. I did. Yeah, I did. made sure he got as, as much as I could. Made sure he got I home. Walking very well at the time, but I, I at least did that. <laughs> Even in my most inebriated state, in my most inebriated state, I still managed to keep it together to get get through the conversation with the guy. Chris, look, I'm overreacting right now because that just you know, holy shit infuriated the hell out of me when I read that. I was not prepared to read that. I understand you may not agree with my personal takes on the world. That's fine. This is my show. I get to share that. And if you don't want to hear it, that's fine. I'm not going to get my feelings hurt if you don't listen. The reality is, is that 20%, 20% of college age kids, and it's even higher if you go younger than that, are on psychotropic medications in the United States. That's one out of every five. I happen to live in a lower income part of town because I'm a lower income kind of guy, right? And, uh, and so I'm going to deal with a bit more of the riffraff than you might in your part of town, sir. I don't know what you do for a living, but I, if I had to guess, you're probably a higher earner than I am, and you live in a better part of town than I do, and you get to be around people with higher degrees of education, two-parent households. There's not a lot of that where I live, right? That's why I have to send my kids to private school where I live, okay? So my point being, my point being is that your observations and my ob- observations are not going to be the same, and it means neither of us are right, and that's totally okay. I'm just going off what I did, and that's why I talk about it here, to get alternative perspectives. I could get a perspective from Ryan, who's going to be way more sensible. Like I say at the start of the shows, Ryan is the sensible one. That's why I call him dad colloquially. It's to be kind and funny and paint the fact that I'm a loose cannon. Did I demonstrate it here from time to time? Yeah. Did I just demonstrate it right now? Absolutely. It is what you get. I'm Again, I, I stand by what I said, and I'm incredibly angry at you that you felt you were so compelled. You were so compelled that I wanted to go back and give that girl a hug and tell her everything was okay, that you felt the need to write in and explain to me why she didn't have a rosy attitude that day. Listen, buddy, I graduated college in 2008. I spent the majority of my first years watching people when I'm riding down the street in a cr- in a true green truck making eleven dollars an hour, having their shit hauled off to the curb. And you know what I did? I still kept a smile on my face. You know why? To still project a little bit of optimism and hope for anyone else that encountered me in the world. That you know what? Everything's still going to be fucking okay because I'm here and alive. Maybe that's just my philosophy. Maybe I'm the fucking asshole for approaching things that way. 
That's why even when I have shitty fucking years, when I when I lose my fucking business and I can't afford a fucking Christmas for my family, I come home from work with a fucking smile on my face. So my kids don't have to fucking worry. So when they go back out into the world, they have smiles on their faces. Have any of y'all ever seen my kids not fucking smiling and happy as shit, except for when something asinine happens, like Noah gets kicked in the shin by his sister and he loses his mind? No, I guarantee you they haven't. You know why? Because they're fucking pleasant people. And you know why? Because when we're home and around him, we teach them that same pleasantry to carry forward out in the fucking public. Yep, exactly, Matt, because that is uh, that is so true, because you know what? You know what else I. uh, I heard frequently when I was growing up. Hey, change your attitude or else you're going to get something to be unhappy about. I heard that regularly. You see. This whole business of, again, entitlement, victimhood, and just general coddling, I think that is going to make our world burn. Okay? That's going to make our world burn burn down to the ground. (laughs) Yeah, there's nothing wrong with with, with teaching children uh, to be a little bit more optimistic when they're in their fucking job. Jesus Christ, to teach them to have a fucking smile on their face. Think about how many times a smile has impacted someone. But I worked retail. Here's another fun one. Last Christmas, I was working two jobs. I worked at a fucking liquor store on the weekend to provide for my family. And it fucking sucked because I worked 100 hours a week. 100 hours a week. 113 hours a week, I averaged for four fucking months. And the whole time I'm in that liquor store, Guess who everybody came to fucking see? I sold more fucking booze with a goddamn smile on my face. You know why? Because I lived another day to have a fucking opportunity to fucking make something of myself, to teach my family that it's fucking okay to struggle and still get out there and do the fucking thing so someone doesn't have to fucking hold my hand. All right, I've got to end this show before I have a heart attack. Um, I love you all. We're going to go hang out with the patrons and let them choose the title of this week's episode. Love you all. Bye. (laughs) Suck my dick, man. That shit fucking, he felt the need to write in over that?